we know that he came to rule. That's what the angel told Mary before he was ever born. He shall be great, he shall be called the son of the highest. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He shall rule over the house of Jacob forever of his kingdom there shall be no end. Luke 1, picking up at verse 30. We know that he came to save souls. We take a look at the words of, oh, there went a button. Uh, <laughs> that'll teach me to put that thing in my pocket, won't it? <laughs> we know that he came to save souls. We take a look at the words of Matthew 1, the angel told Joseph, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He came to suffer. Shortly after his birth, that prophet Simeon told Mary there in the temple, Luke 2, picking up at verse 34, this child is set for the fall and rising up again of many in Israel, and for a sign that shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. He was going to suffer. Throughout his ministry, Jesus told about what awaited. Early in his ministry, speaking with Nicodemus there in uh, John chapter 3, he said, Even as Moses lifted up the serpent of the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. John three fifteen. Or we think about the words of John 8, 28 in the middle of his ministry. As he went back and forth with the doubting Jews of his day, he said, When you've lifted up the Son of Man, you shall know that I'm He. By the time we get to the end of his ministry, John 12, 32 and 33, he said, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. At the beginning, in the middle, and in the end, he spoke of being lifted up. What did he mean by that? Well, John 12, 33 this spake he, signifying what death he should die. When he spoke of being lifted up, he was talking about the cross and being lifted up in his sacrifice. He told his apostles, Matthew 16, 21, they must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and he would be killed and raised again the third day. Or you think about the way that he described it to them in Matthew 20, 18, and 19. He revealed that he would be betrayed and that, that he'd be crucified, lifted up. When the Apostle Paul preached the gospel in Thessalonica, he looked back at the life of Christ and said, Acts 17.3, 17, that he must needs have suffered and been risen the third day. He had to do it. It was imperative. But our question is, why? Why did he have to die? I mean, we're talking about the, the plan of salvation, God's reconciliation with man. Why did Jesus have to die to achieve this? We know from Matthew 26, 28, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. He shed his blood, gave his life to save souls from sins. We know from Acts 20, 28, those elders were told to feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. He paid his blood to purchase the church. When he gave his life, it was to save souls from sins and to purchase the church. But why? Why did it have to come at such a high price? There are numerous passages of Scripture that can be investigated in order to obtain the answer to this question. Perhaps the best place to start will be Romans 5. Romans 5, verse 8. Paul makes a simple yet profound statement when he says, God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Why did Jesus have to die? Well, it's going to have to do with the nature of sin. It's going to have to do with the nature of God. And it's going to have to do with the nature of man. God commended his love toward us. We were yet sinners but Christ died for us. Why did it take death? Why couldn't God just look at man lost in sin and say, okay, I forgive you. Okay, I'm willing to forgive. Let's think about it. Let's begin by looking at the nature of sin. Jesus had to die because we were yet sinners. We think about the words of Titus 2.14 he gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. When he gave himself for us, it was for the redemption from iniquity. Jesus had to die because sin really is that bad. 
sometimes we miss that. Sometimes we, we look at sin in a far different way than God does. Sin demands death. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sin demands death. Okay, but why? Well, think about what sin is. Sin is first and foremost an assault against God. We read 1 John 3, 4, Whosoever sinneth transgresseth also the law, for sin is transgression of the law. Now, another translation has sin is lawlessness. When I sin, I break God's law. Absolutely. A fine definition of sin. But sometimes we miss the idea of God's law. We hear the word law and we start thinking about human laws. Those laws that are laid out so arbitrarily sometimes. Like, like one-way streets that ought not be. Or the arbitrary speed limits that are usually set about 10 miles an hour below what they really ought to be. Men's law are, are arbitrary. But if you violate the law, then, then you've messed up. How often do we start to think about God's law as God having decided, well, we'll let this be your rule and that be your rule. Please understand that when we talk about sin and righteousness, we're not talking about arbitrary decisions on God's part. 1 John 5, 17, all unrighteousness is sin. Sin is a violation of God's law, absolutely. Sin is what is unrighteous. God defines what is righteous, not because at, at some point on a timeless day, eternity gone by, God flipped a proverbial coin and decided, we'll say this is good and this is bad. That is righteous and that is not. It is not as though God decided, mm, truth, yeah, we'll, we'll say truth is better than lies. Yeah, we'll go with truth. Uh, fidelity, yes, we'll go with fidelity over uh, infidelity. No. Righteousness is righteousness because it's a reflection of who God is and what God is. It's not some choice God made. It's a reflection of His very nature and identity. And when I commit unrighteousness, that is me going toe-to-toe -to -toe against God and His very nature. Sin assaults God's nature. It opposes everything about who He is. God is love. God is light. God is life. And when I opt for sin, I opt for hate. I opt for darkness. I opt for death. Sin assaults God. And sin exalts man. Think about the way James described it. James 1 beginning in verse 13. Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lusts and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. When I decide to pursue my own desires, my own wants, that's, that's why I'm following after temptation. That's what leads to sin. And that's what results in death. Sin exalts man. God is light, love, and life. Sin, man chasing after his carnal desires, is darkness, hate, and death. If we're going to understand how bad sin is, we have to understand that it's not just breaking of some arbitrary rule. It is a rejection of everything that God is and an embracing of everything that we are not to be. Why did Jesus have to die? Because sin really is that bad. Think about when, when sin first occurred. God had warned them of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, of the, of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, and the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Genesis 2.17 but man waned. The serpent tempted Eve. She looked at the fruit, saw that it was good for food, lust of the flesh, 
Pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes. Desire to make one wise, pride of life. So she took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her and he did eat. Genesis 3, 6. And in the ensuing period of time, their eyes were open. They realized they were naked. They were ashamed. They covered themselves with the bare minimum aprons of fig leaves. And when God came into the garden, they hid. When they interacted with God, they tried to blame one another. They tried to blame God. They tried to blame the serpent. God, in dealing with man, set things right. He let the woman know that her desire would be to her husband and not to her own whims. He let man know that he would be the leader in the home and he would follow God's will instead of the wishes of his bride. And then Genesis 3, 22 to 24, God said, Man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and eat of the tree of life and live forever, lest man live forever in this state of sin, he is lost and separated from me, and lest he continue perpetually in that state, God cast them out of the garden. And he put at the east of Eden a flaming sword and cherubim to guard the entrance. Sin led to death, mortality. But if you stop to think about it, there's a favor there. Sin demands death. Jesus offers life. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. How is eternal life available through Christ? Well, part of it is realizing that when we talk about sin and the wages of sin being death, sin in its opposition to God doesn't demand death because God is some kind of a tyrant and a hothead. Sin is, death is exactly what a soul chooses when that soul chooses sin. And the only way to counteract that result, if we can even put it in those terms, the only way for there to be remission or forgiveness is for the, the price to be paid. Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood there is no remission. Think about the Old Testament. From the time that first sin occurred, there was death. Adam and Eve were clothed with, with skins instead of fig leaves. Ah, an animal died. As you move forward in time, Abel is offering sacrifices of the, the flock. There's sacrifices being made, blood being shed. You continue to move forward in time. Noah is offering sacrifices. You go all the way to Moses and God gives instructions as to the sacrifices that are being made. And throughout the Old Testament, year by year, month by month, week by week, day by day, the blood flowed. Why? Why did they have a morning sacrifice and an evening sacrifice and a new moon sacrifice every month and a Passover feast and a, a feast of a uh, Pentecost or weeks and a feast of tabernacles or ingathering at the end of the year, all of which involved sacrifices. Why was there a day of atonement on the tenth day of the seventh month? The one day of the year that the priest could enter into the most holy place with blood. Why? Because God gave man constant reminders of the price and penalty of sin. The severity of it. God would tell his people, he didn't need anything from them. And by the way, when we look at Hebrews 10, 4, it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. In fact, the point of all of those sacrifices was to give a constant reminder of just how bad sin is. Hebrews 10, 3, in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance made again of sin year by year continually. Those sacrifices cried, look how bad sin is. That was the point. Remission requires blood because the life of the flesh is in the blood. And sin has chosen death. Thus, it's demanded that consequence. But with God, gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Whereas the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin, Hebrews 10, 4, 
The Hebrews writer moves forward to say that Jesus does not have to offer sacrifices continually year by year, but He, when He had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. There is one sacrifice that could take away sin, one sacrifice that could accomplish remission instead of pushing it forward year by year continually, and that was the sacrifice of Christ. Why? He's innocent. But not only is he innocent, he's accountable. This was not some sacrifice of a child that had never sinned. It was never accountable for sin. This was a grown man that had abstained. Hebrews 4.15, he was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. And not only was this the the death of an innocent, accountable soul that had abstained from sin well into adulthood, but it was a willing sacrifice. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, Philippians 2. Or we think about it in terms of the Hebrews writer when he offered himself a sacrifice for sins. Sin demands blood. Sin, remission requires it. But only Christ had the innocent blood could make the innocent sacrifice that could be the substitute for us. Hebrews 9, 27. It is appointed unto man once to die and after death the judgment. Now think about that. It is appointed unto man once to die and after death the judgment. We're going to face physical death. But afterward there's what, uh, what is described in Revelation as the second death. If we were not subject to physical death, then Jesus could not have died physical death in our place, and thus we would live perpetually until faced with second death. If we were not subject to the Spirit leaving the body, then we would only have the Spirit apart from God in eternity. So when God separated man from the garden, from that tree of life, we read that and we think, oh, what a horrible punishment. He did man a favor. Man had opted for sin. God put man in a situation where we would be constantly reminded of the severity of it. Not because uh, God is that mean, but because sin is that bad. We think about the nature uh, uh, of death, and it is the consequence of sin. Violating God's law. Doing what God calls unrighteous. Omitting God from our plans, violating our conscience as the conscience is trained according to God's word, sin. It really is that bad. Flee fornication, 1 Corinthians 6, 18, because it's sin. And it really is that bad. Thou shalt not lie because it's sin. And it's impossible for God to lie. Sin is an assault against God. But God in His grace has given us something to, to take care of the penalty that we brought on ourselves. So the severity of the consequence is there, in one sense, demonstrating the mercy of who God is. Which brings us to our next point. Sin really is that bad. Romans 5, 8, God commendeth His love toward us. And then while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Sin really is that bad. God really is that good. Have you ever thought about it? He didn't do what, what so often we, we might w would think about doing. Uh, you, you have something that you've made that just seems to fall apart, or you just you, you deconstruct it and start all over, right? God did not eradicate man from the face of the earth and start all over, not even at the flood. Oh yes, he destroyed a generation except for eight souls. But have you ever stopped to think about why didn't he just send Christ 
initially? Why didn't he just send the Christ with the next birth after uh, the sin took place? Because man wouldn't have appreciated it. It's interesting. When Cain killed Abel, God allowed Cain to live. And mankind deteriorated into anarchy, leading to the flood. And it wasn't until they came off of the ark after the flood that God told Noah, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For the image of God made he man, Genesis 9, 6. Instead of instituting capital punishment as soon as Cain committed murder, God let man see what the result of unpunished murderous mentalities are. And then when they came off the ark, God explained how they were to proceed. Instead of sending Christ, he brought about Moses. And he instituted the law because of sin so that they would have even more of a reminder of how bad sin is. It was a learning process. Had God sent the Christ in the garden, man would not have appreciated it. Had God sent the Christ at the flood, man would not have appreciated it. Man needed to learn that a flood would not work. Man needed to learn that a perfect law, and by the way, the law was perfect. It was just never intended to take away sin. A perfect law would not do the trick. Man needed to learn that the only solution for our sin problem was the Christ. And the only way that he could take it away was to face the penalty that we'd incurred. God really is that good. You think about his patience. Jesus had to die because God really is that good. The, 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 the patience he exhibits. 2 Peter 3, 9, he's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. He's long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We see his patience when we find ourselves walking through periods of, of poor decisions, of selfish choices, of sinful behaviors. We see his patience when we look back over the course of human history and we think about the, the terrors that dominated the world through the Middle Ages. We think about the, the horrors that were in existence even shortly after the first and into the second and third centuries. We think about the atrocities committed by ruling nations such as Assyria, Babylon, and Persia. And God was patient, bringing about the solution to all of the sin problem. Whether we talk about humanity as a whole or each human as an individual, he's patient. He really is that good. But not only can his goodness be seen in just how patient he is, he's also been good enough to, to give us proof. Instead of it just being a hearsay story, when Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures, was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, He was then seen of Cephas and the rest of the apostles, then uh, of James, uh, 500 brethren at once, then James, then of the twelve. Last of all, Paul said He was seen of me, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8. By the way, in that passage, Paul's describing the, the gospel message, the message that was preached. And as you work your way through the book of Acts, the message that was preached was Jesus died, Jesus rose, and Jesus was seen. He left witnesses. Look at Acts chapter 2. Paul, uh, Peter rather declared, Acts 2, 24, this Jesus uh, of Nazareth, you have taken him by wicked hands, have crucified and slain, who God has raised up. His death, His resurrection, verse 32, this Jesus hath God raised up where we are witnesses. Acts 3, 15, Peter preaching the gospel in the temple, you killed the prince of life who God has raised up and we are His witnesses. Time and again, working your way through the book of Acts, God not only lets the message of the sacrifice of Christ be declared, but He's given proof, evidence, eyewitnesses, not just hearsay, but eyewitnesses. Over 500 at one time saw him according to 1 Corinthians 15. God does not want us to be convinced based on mere feelings or flutters, based on intuition or impulse. God wants us convinced based on facts and evidence. 
He is good enough to show patience. He's been good enough to give proof. And yes, he was good enough to give Christ. I love the way the Hebrews writer described it. We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. The angels don't die, but they also don't have hope of redemption. We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, mortality, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Jesus faced temptation, but he never tasted sin. What he did taste was the penalty for every one of us by the grace of God. Now, if you think about every other human religion over the course of history, when sacrifices were made, the sacrifices were made from man toward God. And yes, God utilized that sort of a, a, a situation in order to emphasize the severity of sin. At the same time, when the ultimate sacrifice was made, the blood did not flow from man toward God. The blood flowed from God to man. Jesus, the Son of God, God in the flesh, in whom was all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, gave His life that we could be washed in His blood. He's washed up with us of our sins in His own blood, Revelation 1.5. Sin really is that bad. That's why Jesus had to die. Sin's not just some small misdemeanor. It's not just a boo-boo or an oops. It's sin. Do we look at it the way God does? Do we see it in all of its severity? In all that it is in terms of its affront against God? Sin really is that bad. God really is that good. He really has given His Son to take care of the penalty of what we have earned. Remember, the wages of sin is death. When we work for sin, we earn a paycheck. Jesus took care of it for us. Which leads us to one more thought. Sin really is that bad. God really is that good. We go back to Romans 5, 8. God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus did this because of the love of God. Now, the word translated love is that Greek word agape. We've discussed it before. There are different descriptions of agape, but when it comes right down to brass tacks, fundamental, basic meaning, agape is more of a decision than an emotion. It's distinguished from the philia friendship love. It's distinguished from the storge family love. It's distinguished from the eros, physical love. Agape is a love that is a decision. And it, it looks at the value or the worth of the object of the love. Any decision you make in life, you make because it's worth it. Agape says, I love you because I've decided to love you. Agape says, I love you because I see you as worth it. Now you take that idea and you put it in Romans 5, 8. God commendeth his love toward us. He looked at us and we said, he said, they're worth it. You think about John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. He looked upon the world and he said, they're worth saving. And he sent his son to do it. Brethren, we have so many occasions where with the sincerest and most well-intended of sentiment, we will say things such as, I don't deserve what he did for me. And in as much as we cannot earn it, absolutely, it's by grace that we are saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. No, I've earned nothing. But at some point, we must wrap our minds around the way God sees us. He loved us. 
He saw us as worth it. And until we see one another with the same sort of value that God sees in us, we're going to be hard-pressed to be pushed to evangelize. Until we look at one another with the same sort of value that God sees in us, I, I know, don't know that we'll ever fully appreciate the sacrifice that He made. God really is that good, and you really are that precious, that valuable. Jesus' love shows your worth. Yes, the, the sacrifice that He made, John 3, 16, Romans 5, 8, but look at Galatians 2.20. Paul said he loved me, gave himself for me, made it personal. Brethren, frankly, I think Galatians 2.20 is a, sermon, a, a, a passage we probably need to have in every sermon. Remembering that that love was specific. It was not only collective. I love humanity as a whole. And yes, he does and did. But it's also specific. If over the course of human history only one soul had ever sinned and it was you, he saw Calvary as worth it to save you. If over the course of human history only one sinner, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but if, only, uh, if over the course of human history only one sinner was willing to repent and obey the gospel and it was you, you were worth it. Have no doubt. Your face was in his mind's eye when he stayed on that cross. Jesus' love shows what you're worth. It shows your value. It shows your importance. But also, so does his life. What do we mean by that? Well, think of the value of what he gave. 1 Timothy 2, beginning in verse 4, Paul said, God will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He wants all to be saved because there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. He gave himself as the price. Or compare that with the words of Matthew 20, verse 28. Jesus reminded his disciples that he came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a, a ransom for many. He gave his life as a price. Why did Jesus have to die? Because sin really is that bad. Because God really is that good. Because you really are that precious. I know we live in a world where, where people try to convince us that we're worth nothing until they want something from us and they butter us up like a piece of toast. God has demonstrated just what your value is. You're worth all of the emotional pain, all of the physical anguish, all of the suffering that His Son endured. Hebrews 12, 2, For the joy that was set before Him, He endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. What was the joy that was set before him? It was not being in the presence of the Father. He already had that before he came to this world. What was the joy that was set before him that motivated him to endure the cross? It was you being there. You want to know what you're worth? You look at Calvary. And when you look at that, that scene, sin really is that bad. God really is that good. And you really are that valuable. Now, the question that remains is going to be this. What kind of value do you see in yourself? Do, do you see in yourself the, the worth that God sees? If not, why not? Are you ready to recognize it? I want to turn your attention to one more passage. Hebrews 2 conveys very similar ideas regarding to the necessity of Christ's sacrifice. But listen to the way it's worded in three verses from Hebrews 2. Picking up at verse 8, uh, verse 9 rather, we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels 
for the suffering of death, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. It was by the grace of God, because God really is that good, that he died. Or you look at verse uh, 14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part in the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power over death, that is the devil. Through death he destroyed the one that had power over death, the devil, the one that wanted to use sin as the tool, because sin really is that bad. He died because God really is that good, because sin really is that bad. And then look at verse 17. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Reconciliation. Unifying the relationship with God. Because that's what God desired. Because we're worth it to Him. This morning, maybe it's the case you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ. You realize that we are in a situation where we can die to sin instead of in it. Because He died, we can follow after the pattern of His death. Having heard the gospel and believed it. Being willing to repent of sins and confess Christ... Paul said we're buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, we also should walk in newness of life, Romans 6, 3 and 4. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein, Romans 6, 2. We can die to sin and live for God. Maybe it's the case this morning that you're ready to do that. We hope you are. Maybe it's the case this morning that you're a child of God that's fallen away and it's time to come home. Please remember... Sin really is that bad. God really is that good. And you really are that precious. And if it's time to make things right, we hope you'll do so now as we stand together and as we sing.